seems like you Texans know how to laugh. <laughs> Earlier on, I, there was a pin drop silence in this place. I thought, where have I come to? <laughs> you know, for a moment I felt so at home like in India. We Indians are so good at being quiet. <laughs> anyway, I'm sure you had a wonderful, good time hearing the cutting edge word of God this morning through God's prophetic pastor, Joe Sweet. Amen? And I'm sure you have not come here to just hear a sugar-coated message. Are you? No. no. If you have, you will be disappointed. <laughs> Is it okay I just speak to you or share with you anything that God shows? Yes. The good, the bad, the ugly? Even if it pinches you too much? Yes. What about three much? Yes. Four much? Yes. Okay. You would still love me. Yes. How much? Yes. All right. Let's bow ahead for a word of prayer. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before your holy presence this afternoon. Thank you for gathering your dear children from far and near for this conference, Lord. As we come to present ourselves before you, we pray that you will make yourselves known to us. Make your grace known to us. Open our hearts, Spirit of the living God. Open our ears. Give us an understanding heart and a listening ear that we may hear what the Spirit of God is speaking to the churches in these last days. Teach us your ways, O Lord our God, that we that we may walk in your ways and be ready when you come again in glory. In the name of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. If you read Esther chapter 4 verse 14, there you'll find this phrase. For such a time as this, Mordecai, Esther's adopted father, in fact he was the uncle, Esther was Mordecai's uncle's daughter. So in English, you know, the, the terms of relationships are not very clear, where else in the Asian society, we have different words for different relationships. Like for example, the mother's brother is called an uncle. But the father's brother is not called an uncle. He's called, depending whether he's an older brother or younger brother, he's called big father or small father. So when we address a relative by a title, we will know from which side of the family they are from. And in the same way goes for cousins. The mother's side cousins and the father's side cousins. We have different terms. So when we address a cousin by a certain term, we will know, oh, he is from the mother's side. And by another term, oh, we know he is from the father's side. So all the cousins from the father's side are called brothers and sisters. And you cannot intermarry. All the cousins from the mother's side, they are called cousins. And we can intermarry. But in the Western society, everyone is called uncle. Everyone is called an aunt. You don't know which uncle is which, whether he's from the mother's side or from the father's side. Am I right? So, 
Now we let's come back to Mordecai. Mordecai's uncle was Esther's father. So when Esther was very small, her parents died in a car crash. <laughs> Why are you laughing? And Mordecai received a text message. <laughs> I'm just making it appear as if it happened in these times, you know. Once you do that, you'll text message, no? Right? So, so Mordecai and his wife were issueless. So they adopted Esther. And he brought her up to be a fine, beautiful young woman. And when the time came, okay, to make a long story short, she became the queen of Persia. Not just one small nation, but a queen over 127 nations that stretch all the way from Egypt in the west right up to India in the east. That was how huge this Persian empire was. 127 nations. Now, there came a time where there was a danger to the lives of all the Jews. In one day, in a single day, they were all going to be killed. So, Mordecai received the news and he quickly ran to Esther and he told her, please do something. You are the queen. You can do something. And in those days, there was a tradition, a royal tradition that unless you are summoned by the king, you cannot appear before the king even though you are the queen. You can be the queen, you can be the concubine, you can be the queen mother, you can be the king's brother, king's sister, king's children, anybody. It doesn't matter. As long as the king is seated on his royal throne, even his blood relation, they are an ordinary citizens of the nation. So they cannot come before his presence unless they were invited. Protocol rule number one. Or even if they appear, then unless the king stretches out his scepter, they will be killed because you came uninvited. So, Queen Esther told her uncle, don't you know that after my first wedding night, the king has never ever called me again, though he loved me like his own life. He loved Esther so much, but yet he never had her in his bedchamber anymore. So she told him, how can then I go? Don't you know the royal rule? That if I go unannounced, I will be killed. Then Mordecai told her, well, if you fear for your life, and if you will not do anything for the Jewish people, remember one thing. When the killers go out to kill all the Jews, you and your father's house, don't think, Esther, you will be spared. You and your father's house will be killed. Because you are a Jew. Sooner or later they will find out that you are a Jew. Who knows? For such a time as this, you have been brought to stand before the king. You are strategically positioned to be the queen for such a time as this. Not to enjoy the crown on your head. Not to enjoy all the luxuries that comes with being a royalty. No. Not all that. For this moment, God foresaw in his wisdom that there was going to come a time 
where the entire Jewish race is going to be wiped out. If Israel were wiped out that day, there won't be a nation called Israel today because everybody would have been wiped out in one given day. So, Mordecai told her, for such a time as this, see, we stand in the balance. This morning, as I was waiting before God, an angelic being visited me. And then he said, the judgments of God, that's one sentence, the judgments of God have begun. And I looked at him and I asked this angelic being, what do you mean judgments of God have begun? Where have they begun? Upon whom have they begun? And he spoke about three areas where judgments will begin. So, during my sessions in this conference, I will spread out in part by part the various judgments that will come upon a nation, upon the church, and upon church leaders. The judgments of God will come upon all these people. You know, if you read Daniel chapter 6, King Belteshazzar gave a big, huge party and he invited all the princes in their entire province to come and have a jolly good time. And they were drinking and feasting and having orgies in the palace. At the climax of their sinful pleasures, King Belteshazzar committed a sin. Now, if you notice, till then, it appeared that God was blind to their sins, till that moment, until he committed an unpardonable sin. What they did was, during his father's time, Nebuchadnezzar, when they ransacked Israel, they took the vessels from the temple and brought to Babylon. So all the vessels that belonged to the Jewish temple were kept in the Babylonian temple. So they were considered to be holy and precious. They cannot be used for normal purposes. So Nebuchadnezzar had some little common sense. And he kept them in the holy temple. Now, after Nebuchadnezzar, his son Belteshazzar became the king. He seemed to have not, the, not learned the lesson from his father. You know, if you read Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar been warned by God to be humble, not to be inflated by pride not to let his ego to be inflated, but to remain small and humble. Because the Bible says, Nebuchadnezzar was raised by God to discipline and chastise Israel. And Nebuchadnezzar was a servant of God. The Bible calls him like that. So God uses him to discipline Israel in fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 25, where it says that the nation of Israel will go into captivity for 70 years. And God will use Nebuchadnezzar to perform that. And then Jeremiah's prophecy came to pass. Babylon invaded Israel. They burned down Jerusalem. They burned down the temple. And all the Jews, or most of the Jews, including Daniel, Nehemiah, Ezra, were all taken as captives, slaves, prisoners, on a long, long journey from
from Israel all the way up to Babylon, today's Iraq. So while they were there, now Nebuchadnezzar keep on growing in his pride. He did not humble himself. Have you heard of the hanging gardens of Babylon? That is a wonder that even the great scientists and engineers of today are trying to figure out how Nebuchadnezzar did it. With all the modern technology that we have today, they could not recreate the hanging gardens of Babylon that Nebuchadnezzar did without any pumping system, without any electricity, was able to bring water right up to the rooftop and to water all the gardens so that they are always in full bloom. All those kind of wisdoms can only come from God Almighty, right? Not from human wisdom. If it could, our scientists today could have created hanging gardens in Houston. You see, you are so wise to send up rocket from Houston. If you can send up a rocket to Houston, I'm sure you can have a hanging garden in Houston, right? But you are so wise to send rockets up to the Houston. You are so wise to send even a small uh, probe that travel up way out in the universe for many, many months. Have you heard of the recent probe that sat on a meteor and just woke up after a coma? Not only people go into coma, even satellites. <laughs> they go into a coma and suddenly it opened its eyes and beamed a message to Houston. Houston, hello. Right? Have you read the news? With all this great wisdom, we cannot create the hanging gardens of Babylon. Anyway, Nebuchadnezzar saw a dream. In the dream, he was warned, humble yourselves. If you don't, then you will be cut. So, the book, uh, Daniel the prophet interpreted the dream. And Daniel loved Nebuchadnezzar so much. He said, oh great king, let this interpretation be a joy to your enemies. That was his first sentence, you know. This is not a good interpretation. He said, you please, he told him to do two things. Number one, humble yourselves. Number two, do good. Do good. Give away your riches. Give to charities. Do good. Give to the poor. You know, when you give, it shows that you are not haughty. When you give, it shows that you are not self-centered. When you give, it shows that you are putting your trust in God to take care of you. When you give, it shows that God can trust you with riches to bless others. That you will not hoard up to yourself. When you give, it shows that you are humbling yourself before God. Acknowledging that he is the giver of all good things. So Daniel gave him this counsel. And did Nebuchadnezzar pay heed to it? Unfortunately, no. So the Bible says, one fine day, he was just walking in his palace. You know, whenever you are idle, you sin. We read of two kings who were idle and they were walking around their palace. Instead of watching TVs or on their cable, at least they are doing some kind of activity, they were just idle. When they were idle, you know, you want to do something, right? You are idle. Like before this meeting, I was uh, made to sit in the green room. And nobody was in the green room. I was all alone. 
and I was kind of feeling bored. So instead of sitting on the chair, I stood up and started walking, you know, to kill some boredom. So walking and praying. And that's what these two kings did. David and Daniel. Oh, sorry. David and Nebuchadnezzar. They were walking. So they were walking from one end of the palace rooftop to the other end of the palace rooftop. And Nebuchadnezzar looked at all the great buildings and palace that he has built, including the hanging gardens of Babylon. Even if you go to Iraq today, in the southern western part of Iraq, there is the city of Babylon. And uh, Saddam Hussein had remade the huge, awesome palace of Nebuchadnezzar, minus the hanging gardens. So as he was walking, looking, and he said, My great Babylon! The moment he said that, a voice came down from heaven. Now this was 12 months after he was warned. See how good God is. Before he judges you, he warns you and gives you a space of time to repent. That's the goodness of God. Nobody can say God judged us unjustly. 12 months before he was judged. He was warned, firstly. Secondly, he was given a long time to put his house in order. And he failed. And a voice came down from heaven. And he said, you are judged. The moment that voice said, you are judged, that very instant, this huge man, a man called Nebuchadnezzar was transformed into a wild bird. Many scholars say that uh, his mind went deranged and he was driven out of the palace. That's not true because the scripture says he became like a wild bird. His entire DNA in his body changed. If you don't believe me, you know that African witch doctors, witches could do that, transform their bodies into different shapes of animals. Have you heard of that? It's possible. If the witches can do that, can't a judgment from God do that? Right, everybody? So his entire human structure was transformed into a wild bird. Nobody recognized him. His attendants walked into his bedchamber one day and they found a strange looking huge bird and they chased away that bird. And Nebuchadnezzar was nowhere to be found. One entire year, he was a bird. His mind was there, you know. His mind was there. He was punished for his pride. The day that you take your eyes away from the good things that God has done for you. The scripture says, no, it is God who makes you to get wealth. The day you take your eyes off that and you begin to hold up wealth for yourself. That's the day the judgment of God will fall on you. The day you take your eyes off from God, who made you strong and mighty, that's the day you will crumple. The day you take your eyes off from God, who caused you to increase and to expand your borders and your boundaries, that's the day your walls will start crumpling down. The day that you forget that it was God who caused in, in a landmass that had no name, 
a landmass that nobody knew, a landmass that only had Indians who were cowboys and red Indians. That's how I grew up knowing about the Indians. No? From small, I grew up hearing about cowboys and red Indians. <laughs> I've never heard the word native Indians until I came to the US. To me, when I was growing up, until 1991, when I first visited the US, a native Indian was a red Indian. That was the image that was presented to us. A landmass that was just like that. In God's appointed time, Christopher Columbus discovered America. And you know why Christopher Columbus discovered America? That was because the Jews were going to be expelled from Spain. Before they were expelled, God made a place of refuge for his people. Amen? You know the history, right? I just recently discovered that when I was studying about the blood moon. That was the first tetrad blood moon. You know? So before they were going to be expelled, and if they were expelled and they had nowhere to go, the entire Jewish nation that were the movers and the shakers would all have drowned in the sea. America would not have become a superpower nation. But Christopher Columbus came, discovered America, God made a place of refuge for his people. And when they were all expelled, from Spain, this nation opened its arms and welcomed her. The movers, the shakers, the bright minds, Jewish minds, they all came to the U.S. You became a superpower, militarily, financially, economically, anything. Is because of God's people in your nation. Amen? This is the bad truth. Now, from a landmass that was nothing, God lifted you up. God prospered you up. And that is why your founding fathers, when they founded this nation, they bent their knees they prayed and they dedicated this land to God. I do not know how many, how much you know about all this. Neither did I until God showed me. A few years ago, I was preaching in um, Michigan. And one day, as I was ministering, the Lord showed me. He said, tell these people, the prayers of George Washington is still fresh before my eyes. I, no, I, don't, I don't know anything about the history of the U.S. So I asked the Lord, what do you mean by that? At that moment, I saw a vision. In the vision, I saw George Washington kneeling like this. Just in this position, his head bowed down and he prayed with sobbing and with tears, crying for the nation and dedicating her to God. And I saw the tears roll down his eyes and fall on the sand, on the ground. And the, the ground where his tears fell became soaked with his tears. And the Lord came down, scooped up the sand and he took it up to heaven and they are preserved before him. From that day till today, that tears-filled sand 
is crying out to God for America. You know what they are praying? Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The prayers of George Washington, God's servant, who dedicated the land to God. He remembers that. But all your subsequent kings have forgotten till your present king. All have forgotten the covenant they made with God. Not only the covenant they made with God, but also the covenant they made with God's people, Israel. They have forgotten all that. Now you have become self-centered. Instead of in God we trust, it's become in the mighty dollar we trust. Instead of saying in God's strength we trust, it has become in the might of the military we trust. Instead of looking up to God for everything, you have now begun to look inwards to the greatness of your might, to the greatness of your ability. You have begun to be like how Nebuchadnezzar had become. And judgment fell upon Nebuchadnezzar. And this is the word that came to me, the judgments of God. Please turn your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 14. And let's look at verse 6 and 7. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Please look at the phrase in verse 7. The hour of his judgment has come. Several other translations of the Bible put it like this. The time has come when God shall sit as judge to judge all people. So this is the first word that came to me this morning. That God's judgments has come for the nations. God will judge the nations. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 14. All nations and every nation sins, they are coming up to God, coming up before Him in its order of intensity. How great are the cries! You know, if you have wireless internet, there's a small little icon on your laptop that shows the number of the bars of the strength of the signal. Am I right? When you have the greatest strength, it shows four bars or five bars. And depending on the strength and the weakness of the signal, the bars get reduced. Sometimes when the signal is so weak, it shows you a yellow flag, right? Means too weak, about to go off. So, depending the number of bars, it shows the strength. In the same manner, according to this intensity, the greatness of the sins of a nation, it reaches out to God first. It goes out to God first. So, whose cries are the greatest? They reach heaven first. Let me give you a very good example. The Bible tells us that the earth cries out to God. If you read Isaiah chapter 24, verses 4 and 5, chapter 33, verse 9, and Romans chapter 8, verse 22, it says that the earth is groaning 
the earth is mourning the earth is groaning in pain it's crying out to god god i cannot take it any more all the nations of the earth every nation is crying out to god god we cannot take it any more we cannot take it any more when the sins of the land are great now let me tell you one thing if you read first kings chapter 18 there were two runners running in a race one was king ahab on a chariot the other was elijah and elijah told ahab after three years it's going to rain a torrential rain cats and dogs are going to rain down from the skies don't know where they get that saying from you know do you say it's raining cats and dogs so far i have never seen any have you anyway oh thank god anyway so elijah told him it's going to rain a torrential rain is going to come and you don't even have an umbrella eh hab you don't have an umbrella you don't have an overcoat so you better get on your chariot and drive as fast as you could so that you reach the palace before a single drop of rain touches you so king ahab knew that he should believe and trust elijah's words because he just saw elijah slaughtering 850 false prophets if ahab did not listen he would have been the 851st person so he better obey so he mounted up on his chariot driven by two fast horses and as he was driving past by zoom faster than a speeding bullet faster than a bird who's that not superman <laughs> elijah you know i made a little research horses can run 60 miles per hour that's how fast a horse can run an average horse so a chariot is pulled by two horses now two horses running at 60 miles per hour that's a lot of horsepower don't you agree now let's look at the weight of a chariot i do not know how heavy a chariot is let's suppose it's 100 pounds okay and then a hab or a hab how many pounds would it be 100 Okay, not two hundred, not that, not that fat, you know. <laughs> Sorry, I should I say big? A fat is a fat, you know. Anyway, okay, big. So hundred pounds, uh, okay, hundred and twenty pounds, okay. Hundred and twenty pounds plus a hundred pounds. That's two hundred pound weight of drag. and 60 miles per hour horses pulling a drag so their speed can be lowered to let's say 40 or 50 okay i'm not a mathematician we are just playing jeopardy game <laughs> okay we are making some lucky guesses now statistics tell us or the guinness book of records tell us the fastest man that can run is a maximum of 20 miles per hour that's how a, the fastest man can run 20 miles per hour so let's suppose usain bolt you know usain bolt okay he's the fastest sprinter on planet earth say okay carl lewis you know carl lewis okay we'll forget about usain bolt he's not american let's bring carl lewis full blooded american I'm into lots of sports, you know. <laughs> so, Carl Lewis, Carl Lewis is running on a race with the horses. And by the time Carl Lewis takes a few steps, the chariot would have gone many, many hundreds of feet. Agree, everybody? 
So, the fastest man is no match because he can run at 20 miles per hour and the horses are running at least about 40 miles per hour. But here comes Elijah who outran the horses, which means Elijah must have run more than 60 miles per hour. Agreed everybody? Which is humanly impossible. It is humanly impossible and if you achieve it, then it is supernatural, right? Now, this is something that God has reserved for the last day's church to pour out the powers of the age to come. And when these powers of the age to come is poured out on the last day's remnant church, whatever feats and miraculous works that you read in the Bible will all look like child's play. This was the revelation the Lord gave me when I was in Louisiana in 2008, when I was visited by four angels who were the chief angels of the state of Louisiana. And the chief among them spoke to me and he said, God wants you to speak on the powers of the age to come in this conference. You know, except for the, the phrase powers of the age to come that you read in the book of Hebrews chapter 6, I don't know anything about that subject. So for the next two hours, the angels taught me what it means to have the powers of the age to come. And among the many things, after explaining all that, he told me in one summarized sentence, whatever the miracles that you read in the Bible will all appear like child's play when the powers of the age to come is poured out. And he made a startling sentence that blew my mind off. He said, even the angels in heaven have not seen such a move of the Holy Spirit yet. That really blew me, you know. The first part when he says the, the miracles in the Bible will appear child's play did not shake me. But when he said the angels in heaven have not seen such a move of the Holy Spirit yet, that really blew my mind off because they have seen the work of the Holy Spirit from creation. When the Holy Spirit brewed on the waters over the earth and it recreated earth from chaos, the angels have been watching, right? They've been watching how the Holy Spirit did all that work. God spoke and the Holy Spirit made it come to pass. The entire creation in the whole wide universe, all the galaxies that we admire, they were all done by the Holy Spirit. And the angel said, we have not seen yet the great and awesome things the Holy Spirit is going to do when the powers of the age to come anointing is poured out upon the last day's remnant church. Now let's come back to Ahab and Elijah. Those two men represent two people group. Ahab represents the wicked and the sinners in the land. And Elijah represents the praying people, the intercessors, those who will take hold of God and pray. Now please listen. Which, whichever touches the finishing line, that will come upon the nation. If the sin touches the finishing line first, or let's put it the other way, if the sin reaches God's throne first, then it will open the floodgates of judgment. But if the cries of God's people reach heaven first, see two kind of cries, cries from the land and cries from the church. But if the cries 
from the church, the true church. We are not just talking about the so-called church. There are two kinds of churches today, no? The bride of Christ and the bride of the devil. Right? There are two kinds of bride. So, when the true church cry reaches heaven, instead of judgment, mercy and righteousness will reign upon a nation. See, that is the purpose God reveals all this. Before judgment, mercy. Amen. So the cries of the nation reaches God. In Genesis chapter 18, we read of an encounter between God, two angels and Abraham. And in Genesis chapter 18 verse 20, God tells Abraham, the cries of Sodom and Gomorrah have reached my ears. They have reached my ears and I have come down to see for myself the intensity, the gravity of the cries that I have heard. He came down. The Bible tells us, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah was not only destroyed because they were a nation of gays and lesbians. So not only that, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 13 verse 13, they were a greatly wicked people. If you look at the gays in your society today, they are fashionable people, right? They are like upmarket people. You have senators who are gays, am I right? You have judges who are gays. You have your lawmakers who are gays. Now, they all don't look like wicked people. They all are nice people, right? Very nicely dressed, all sitting in high offices. You will never ever imagine the rulers of the land are gays unless and until they open their mouth and identify themselves. Now you have a string of Hollywood celebrities who are openly and claiming that they are gays. Look at them, all fashionable celebrities, right? And even sports celebrities, sports stars, they are openly claiming it's no more shameful thing. No more shameful thing. Rather, it has become a fashionable statement. I'm a gay. Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed not because they were all gays. The Bible says they were extremely wicked people. Secondly, in Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 49 to 50 says that there was gross wickedness in Sodom and Gomorrah. There was a lot of wealth in Sodom and Gomorrah and they were not giving to the poor. Lot of wealth. They have too much of wealth, they need not work. So they were a nation of idle people. Idle, they were just idling around. And there was so much of food that they were throwing and wasting. You know, just a, a couple of months ago, I read in an article, one of the richest billionaires in India, this is a true story, went to Hamburg in Germany. So they were trying to make some business contacts, you know. So they found a German company and they were trying to tie up some business deals. And after their business talk, they went out for lunch. And they went to a restaurant which was not populated. Not much people were there. So they thought maybe because most of the people are poor. So there were very, very few people, German people eating in the restaurant. And they glanced to their right, there were two old women that were sitting in a corner eating very little food. So they thought it must be these poor people, they didn't have much money and they're just eating little food. And 
these were two Indians and uh, two Germans. They ordered huge, sumptuous, many, many dishes. And they add, and they add, and they add. When you have too much of food, there's so much only you can eat, right? There is no expander inside to expand it, you know, right? It's only a limited capacity. So, about half of all the food they ordered were uneaten, and they called for the check. Now, these two women, old women, who were just minding their own business and eating food, just looked at over, glanced at their table, came over to them and scolded them for wasting all this food. She rent, rentled them in her heavily accented Texan German. And those, uh, those uh, Indians and the Hamburgans looked at her and she said, Woman, what is that to you? It's our money. We are paying for it. Whether we eat or we don't eat, we are paying for it. What's your problem? She looked at them, you know, small little German woman with a cure look in her eyes, like a hawkish look on her eyes. She pulled out her cell phone. She called the police. And the police came. Within minutes, the police came and fined this man for wasting food. So those men, they protested. They said, no, what, what's your problem? It's our money. And we are paying for it. So the policeman said, here in this city, we don't waste our food resources. Eat what you can. It's your money. But the food is our food. Our resources. Don't waste. Eat what you can. Order what you can. Don't waste the food. Because what you waste is waste, right? Nobody can eat that. Nobody wants to eat that. Am I right, everybody? But Sodom and Gomorrah was like that. Too much of food. And they were great wasters. Gross sins. Great wickedness. It's just not just their flirtatious lifestyle, but all kinds of sins that compounded that God decided to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Some nations don't want to repent. Even when they are warned, the Bible tells us in Jeremiah chapter 51, verses 7 to 9, they don't want to repent. It's inside them. They don't want to repent. Let me give you an example. In Jonah chapter 3, verse 4, Jonah went to Nineveh and he preached for three days, walking from the west to the east, from one end of the nation to another end of the nation, three days walking journey. And he cried with just one message, in 40 days, this nation will be destroyed. Just one sentence, from one end to another end, he kept on repeating, his message, in 40 days, this city will be destroyed. And the Bible tells us that when the king heard it, he repented and they all cried out to God, hoping. You know, this is a unrighteous king who said, let's all cry out to God. He's not a Christian king. This king doesn't know the true God. But as soon as he heard the word from a prophet. This prophet is not a Ninevite. He came from Israel. So he is a foreigner. So the king heard the word of a foreigner and he humbled himself, put away his royal robes, put on sackcloth, sat in ashes and he said, who knows if this God will not have mercy on us. Who knows? Let's all humble ourselves. Whether he will destroy us or whether he will have mercy on us, we don't know. 
let's take a gamble. Let's humble ourselves. Who knows? If he can be moved, who knows? For such a time as this. Who knows? If he looks at our humbling and he's moved with compassion, moved with mercy, let's take our chances. What do we stand to lose? Let's do it. A whole nation from the sucking baby right up to the king. Even the cats, the dogs, the mouse, everybody fasted. Everybody fasted. Entire nation. Can you imagine President Obama sitting in sackcloth and ashes? Your nation will become a holy nation. Right? The whole nation fasted and prayed and because of that, God's mercy was given to them instead of destruction. But it only lasted for 100 years. And eventually, Nineveh was destroyed according to the prophecy of Jonah. It was destroyed because they won't stay repented. They don't want to change for righteousness. There are some people, some nations who don't want to repent even when they are warned. God in his great mercy warns us, but we don't want to repent. Those nations' cup becomes full and overflow. See, when you don't want to repent, what happens? Your cup run becomes full and it begins to overflow. Joel chapter 3 verse 13. When it begins to get full and overflow, there's still mercy, you know, when it reaches the brim. There's still mercy because it hasn't overflow yet. God's judgment comes when it begins to overflow. But till even when it reaches the brim, God still waits because there's still time for you to repent and turn back. It's the goodness of God, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. That is why he waits patiently even for a thousand years. That's what the Bible says. A thousand years to us is just a day to God. To him it seems that he's waiting for a day, but to us it seems that it's a thousand days. Why? Thousand years because he's not willing that any perish. All should come to repentance. He's not willing. He's waiting, waiting, and waiting. And when the cup is full of sins, abominations, filthiness, and fornication, then it spills over. When that happens, what is the sign that the cup is full and is about to overflow? Bright blossoms. That, that is the first sign you can see. People or a nation or a church or a minister or a ministry becomes very arrogantly prideful. Ezekiel chapter 7 verse 10 bright blossoms. Look at Lucifer's life. If you read Ezekiel chapter 28 verses 15 to 17, the Bible says, you were perfect in all your ways till iniquity was found in you. He was perfect from the day Lucifer was created till iniquity was found. He was perfect. There was no sin, nothing in him. He was a perfect angel, the chiefest among all angels in heaven. But when iniquity was found, it has bluesome inside him. Pride has bluesome. That is why you read in Isaiah chapter 14, 
verses 12 to 14. He says, I will ascend my throne above the Most High God. Five times he said, I, I, I. And you know, five stands for grace. He lost the grace. When he allowed pride to bruise him inside him. You try to imagine now, how can a created angel equal with God? How is it possible? God is uncreated. Light. He dwells in unapproachable light. So if God dwells in unapproachable light where no one can approach him, how dare did Lucifer ever thought that he can be equal with God or even worship God? That's deception. When you open your heart to pride, deception creeps in and makes you think there is none equal to you. You are the one and only. That's pure deception. Any nation, any church, any minister, any ministry that ever thinks they are the one, it is a sign that pride has bluesome. But till they don't say that, there's still room. A good example is Nebuchadnezzar. He said, my great Babylon, pride bluesomed. And immediately he was judged. And God judged, he judges the nations when the cup becomes full. And when pride bluesomes, what is the accompanying works in a nation? Wickedness and violence increases. Ezekiel chapter 7 verse 11. Wickedness and violence increases in the land. Just two weeks ago or, ta- or ten days ago, a teenage boy or just twenty-something walked into a black church in Charleston, South Carolina and gunned down nine parishioners. Now what is that? Wickedness of an unimaginable scale, right? Little, little kids, even little children walking into school with a gun in their hands, right? This, it doesn't only take place in the US, no? it also takes place in India. One of our ministry's partner, this happened a few, about two years ago, our ministry's partner, a wonderful Christian who does good Christian ministry, she was teaching and she reprimanded a student. That was the end of it. Lunch break, this lady was sitting at her table and marking the books and the student who was reprimanded came and stabbed her a few times and killed her on the spot. This shocked the nation because such things have never taken place before. In my home state and in the very city where I live, we have never ever heard such things before. But you see, I, we should thank you, you know, for exporting all your Hollywood movies. <laughs> see, what is Hollywood teaching today? Gun violence, right? Any kind of movies you watch today, there is filled spice with violence. So people who are watching such movies, what's going inside them? Take a gun, get a gun, go and shoot around. Psychos, right? Psychos walking everywhere, shooting everyone. Violence and wickedness increases in the land. And when that happens, what is the next result? They sin openly for all to see. Ezekiel 21 verse 24. They are no more ashamed of their sins. Now yesterday, the US Supreme Court 
pass an unimaginable law. Now the whole nation of the U.S. has passed the same-sex marriage bill. You know, let me tell you one thing. Two days ago, I was, uh, not two days ago, last week I was in Costa Mesa in California to speak at a Chinese church conference. And there, I had a visitation from the Lord Jesus. And the Lord, you know, my room faces the city. And there's a nice, huge window, huge sliding doors. And I was meditating those scriptures, and the Lord Jesus appeared before me. And he stood by the glass window, and he's looking into the city. And he said, come and stand with me. So I came and stood beside the Lord, and he was just looking at the city, and he said, this city is going to be destroyed. I was shocked. I, I said, why, Lord? He said, these people are worse than the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. And I was shocked. And there were many other things. Maybe in the other few sessions, I will share that with you. Yesterday, we were at the Los Angeles airport, standing in queue to board the flight to Houston. And as I was standing there, I felt a strange sensation of the presence of God around me. And I turned to my right and I saw an angel stand beside me. And he said, again he said, this city will be destroyed with a massive earthquake. And when he said that, I looked, I looked up, now who was speaking to me? And I saw this angel was so huge and mighty that his top reaches the cloud. That was how huge he was. And he had a long, huge sledge hammer in his hand. And he said, you just strike this place. Now, on the flight from Los Angeles to Houston, I was pondering in my heart, something is wrong. Why, in just a few days apart, I would get a revelation like this, the same thing repeated twice. Why? I was pondering that, you know. Till this morning, I was pondering within me, in the past, I had many, many words for U.S., but not given to me in such a succession, in such a short time, the same thing repeated two times. I was wondering why, until this morning, when I opened my email, and there I received this news. Same-sex marriage bill passed by the Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court is like the gatekeeper of your nation, right? So the highest legal authority in the nation passed a bill. They made a decision and they opened the floodgates of the nation. See, they opened the floodgates of the nation. The Supreme Court are the judges of the land, right? Like the judges. A judge is like the king. Now, they opened the floodgates of the land for an avalanche of demonic spirits to invade the nation. Then I understood, you know, why the Lord told me in Costa Mesa that this nation is worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. More wicked and worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. Even now, as I'm speaking to you, I'm, I'm shaking inside me, you know. This is not good. Every time, when God tells me something like this, I fall on my knees, and I hold on to him, and I cry out to him, Lord, what about your remnant people? What about your remnant people? 
And in Costa Mesa, I asked the Lord the same question. Lord, what about your people? There are the righteous people there. The remnant is there. We cannot deny the fact that the large majority are wicked. But what about the righteous people? Like Abraham interceded, no? I cried out to God. I said, Lord, what about them? And the Lord told me, they will be protected. At the right time, I will send my angels and ask them to flee from this place. You know, this is my second visit to Houston. I first came to Houston in 2003 to speak at, for a small Chinese church. All the Baptist churches in Houston, the Chinese churches, they all gathered together and we did a conference for them. That was in 2003. So this is the second time that I'm coming in over a decade. So I, the only thing I know about Houston is NASA. <laughs> because when I was small, I wanted to be an astronaut. So I read all about NASA. But that ambition did not come to pass in the natural. But it was fulfilled in the spirit. <laughs> anyway, so the only thing that I know about Houston is NASA. Everybody knows that, right? Yesterday, when I stepped out from the airplane, and as soon as my feet touched Houston Airport, I heard the still small voice of the Holy Spirit say, this place will be devastated by floods. I didn't know anything about all that, you know. So I just, I was wondering why, what a strange what I'm hearing. I began to feel that I'm an unlucky person. Every, everywhere that I go, I don't seem to bring a good word of blessing. You know, I try to be a good boy, you know, by trying to make you feel good, God bless you. You will be well, wealthy, healthy, prosperous in all your ways. I try to do that, no? I could not. I'm sorry. But I was wondering, you know, the moment my feet touched Houston, the Houston soil, or rather the Houston dust. I heard this word. And I, I didn't know what to, Pastor Josephine was beside me, we were walking. I didn't tell this to anybody. I just kept it to myself. And uh, the brother who picked us from the airport, he was driving us to the hotel. And in the conversation, he mentioned about flooding in Houston. I didn't quite clearly hear what they said, you know, because I was... I was still lost in my thoughts about what, what the Lord said in uh, Costa Mesa and then what I heard the angels say at the Los Angeles airport. I was just troubled by all that. You know? And uh, when I reached the hotel, I was still pondering those words. What, what does it mean? I will devastate. He didn't use the word destroy. I, I clearly remember the word. God used the word Devastate, not destroy. Destroy means make a complete end. Devastate means cause damage. To wake you up to think. To wake you up, it's, devastation is a forerunner to destruction. Before destruction comes, it shakes you up. Come on, wake up. It's a shakening, devastation. So I tried to remember and I googled this morning, Houston flooding and a whole bunch of articles came up. Then I saw, oh my God, this happened recently, right? In the month of May, when there was a great flooding in the city. And not only that, before this great flooding, the first major great flooding in Houston took place in 1935. That was the first time there was a massive, great flooding in Houston, and it devastated. And the news media uses the same word, devastation. So it seems that there is a history of flooding in Houston. 
and it is an instrument used by God. If you remember that we read in Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, that the judgments of God comes upon the waters and the fountains and the rivers. You know, God removes the boundaries and the waters overflow. They overflow. Even the seas. The Bible says, God puts a command, so much you can come. He puts the boundaries. But if, when God removes the boundaries, then they come rushing into the towns, rushing into the cities, rushing everywhere. Your rivers overflow. About 15 years ago, I was in St. Louis. That was my first visit to St. Louis. And I went up, I mean, after I finished ministering, as I came and sat in the pew, I saw this angel walk towards me. He said, you are not done yet. I want you to give you a word for this nation. So I went up to the pulpit, and this angel told me, tell these people that unless rivers of intercession flows in this nation, like the Mississippi, great destruction will come upon the nation. And this angel I saw was the chief prince angel of the United States of America. And I've seen this angel many times in the past, ever since, you know. He stands so huge right near where the Statue of Liberty is with a long drawn sword and he stands guard looking over the whole of North America. He is your chief prince. For protection or for destruction. The two things can happen. The same chief prince Michael that protects Israel is also the same angel that destroys Israel. God uses his agents, his angels, for a blessing or for judgment. The sins of USA are more than the sins of others. If you read Ezekiel chapter 5, verse 6, my dearly beloved brothers and sisters, the nature of God is like this. Before God judges, he sends his prophets to warn. So many prophets, not only those who are from outside the U.S., even from American prophets, true prophets, not those who just explain away everything. We don't want to hear those prophets. True prophets. God raised them up to warn the nation of judgments. And God also shows signs and wonders in the heavens. A lot of people in the last two years I've heard of shofar being blown in the skies. Have you heard of that? See, strange signs. You know, a shofar is a sound of a warning. It's a sound of a warning. A sound for war, a sound of warning, a sound of get ready, or a sound of it's going to come. It means many things. Now you have heard people from many parts of the US have reported, they have heard this sound of a trumpet, sound of a shofar being blown from coast to coast. God has spoken to his prophets, God has spoken from the heavens. What more do you want? Two, immutable, unchangeable evidences, voices that God has spoken. But what do we do? Most pastors, most teachers, many, many false prophets, false pastors, false teachers in your great nation, just brush away all that. Oh, no, no, this is not God's judgment. God is a good God. God is that. God is this. You just brush away everything. If you read Acts chapter 12, 
Let me give an example. Acts chapter 12 verses 1 to 15. Peter was in prison and the whole church was praying for his release. They did not engage an attorney to fight his case, which we popularly do. The sooner we learn biblical patterns, the greater will be our victory. Rather, the whole church fasted and prayed day and night. A chain prayer was done by the church for Peter's release. And God heard his prayer and an angel was sent to set Peter free. Now, Peter came out of the prison and he came to where all these believers were congregated. He knocked on the door. So, people heard a knock on the door and the servant went and say, who goes there? So Peter say, it is I. And this girl recognized Peter's voice. You will know your own voice, don't you? So she recognized Peter's voice. She was shocked. She ran back in without opening the door. She said, it's Peter. He's there. Now look at how the church reacted. This is the church that was praying day and night for his release. And when a miracle took place, they say, it's not Peter, it's his angel. Don't worry, let's get back to business. So, what did they do? They just brush away a supernatural work of God, explaining it away as if it's something natural. What they did then, that's what they do today. Just explain away everything. When an earthquake strikes, the scientists come and they say, oh, the tectonic plates brush against each other. Right? My question is, what causes the tectonic plates to brush? There must be a reason, right? Oh, then they say, oh, the pressure is building up. Okay, good. What causes the pressure to build up? Right? What causes two plates that are so peaceful with each other for such a long time suddenly becomes enemies? <laughs> suddenly, it is a Mike Tyson and an enemy fighting. <laughs> Holyfield and Mike Tyson. And one bites the ear of the other. Nobody forgets that till today, you know. <laughs> right? So what causes the plates to cr brush against each other? There must be some reasons, right? You know, I have seen, and I have some, another wonderful prophet of God in India who has seen the angels stamping their foot down on the ground and that causes the shaking of the plates. Nothing happens just by itself. It must be triggered, right? So, before God sends judgment, He warns us. And the Bible tells us in Ezekiel chapter 7, verse 9, when the day of His judgment comes, when He lifts up His hand to judge, He will not spare neither will his eyes show pity. When it is marked for judgment, it is marked for destruction, he will not spare any longer. And what I fear for you very much now is what just happened yesterday, the, high, the Supreme Court judgment. It has thrown open the nation for God to look at her and judge her. You know, I remember hearing from a very, very respectable prophet of God from the U.S. who received a word from God like this. Among the many words that he has received, many things have come to pass. And one word was, the day you see the gays and the lesbians coming out of the closet, that is the day, the last days. Means they are no more hidden. 
they no more keep their shameful, sinful life a secret. They come out of the closet and they're making an open claim to that. Unashamed. Openly saying, this, this is what, so what? It's good. Right? From small, I had a womanly kind of instincts. So right now, I've decided to change my gender from a male to a female. That made news. Right? You know who I'm talking about. That made news, news and waves. Now, look, a celebrity like that, when they come out and make a statement like that, you know, those are the devil's prophets. They are the devil's apostles and the devil's prophets. When they come and make a statement like that, it's like preaching a word, it's okay. Hey, it's okay. An alternate lifestyle is okay. That's the message they are preaching. The gospel they are preaching. And what will happen to all the millions of kids that he or she received? Overnight, he had a million tweets, followers. Right? Now, what will all the followers adopt? That lifestyle. You know, yesterday, I had a lunch with a believer in California. And he works for the government agency that treats people who have this kind of dubious lifestyles and are homeless people and all that. And he th he's doing a master's degree in psychology. And he told me yesterday that in the state of California, a large number of Christians are adopting dogs, buying dogs, whereas a large number of the gay people are adopting babies. 40,000 so far. 40,000 gay uh, couples have adopted 40,000 babies. Now I want you to imagine like this. 40,000 little babies are brought up by gay couples what values will those little babies learn? Gay values, right? So, you know what is happening in your great nation now? They are preparing the next generation. You are going to become a nation of gays. Where the church will become a small minority. Lesser than a remnant. That's what you're going to become. And you're not doing anything about it. You're just hearing and you're walking away. You know, when that uh, Charleston shooting took place, I sat down and I watched the news and I was feeling remorseful, you know. I said, this little, this young boy, 21 years old, just went into this church and he's proud about that. He said, I planned this for a long time to make a statement. And not only make a statement, but start up a race war all over the US. I was looking at that. And then I called to remembrance that either last year or the year before last, when I was speaking at the conference in Lancaster, the word of the Lord came unto me, there will be communal riots between the blacks and the whites. And how the blacks will be killed and that will cause racial riots. So I called to remembrance. At that moment, the Lord Jesus walked into my room, came and sat beside me. And he too was watching the news. And then he turned around and asked me a question. Two years ago, I revealed to you that this will happen. What did you do about that? I was shocked. I looked at the Lord. I dropped on my knees. And I fell at his feet. And that day I realized one thing, you know. Not only a revelation should be revealed, but you should pray that it does not come to pass. 
I was guilty. I repented before God. I said, I am so sorry, Lord. I repented. Then that's when the Lord gave me a message for such a time as this. What should we do? Which I preach at the conference in the Chinese church for such a time as this. Then the Lord began using Esther's example. He elaborated to me. A warning was given to Esther. What did she do? She did not walk away. She did something about it. She fasted. She prayed. As a result, the destruction was averted. If the 600 people who heard your prophecy that day had done something about it, prayed that there won't be a racial riots, that killing would not have taken place. That incident in Ferguson would not have taken place. None of the whites killing the blacks would have taken place. The riots in Ferguson, the, the killing in Charleston would not have taken place. But what are we doing? You know what? Let me tell you honestly, okay? People like you are. See, when I say people like you, please forgive me. I don't mean that I'm better than you. Please don't think like that. Remnant people like you all who go to such meetings like this, good people like you all who don't want to hear sugar-coated message. But you know a mistake you make? You hear, you just walk away. You are worse than those who hear a sugar-coated message. You are worst. Because you hear, you know. What did you do about it? You heard it. What did you do about it? You stand a greater damnation than those who have not heard. The remnant church must not only hear the prophetic word of God. You must do something about it. You must bend your knees and pray. Bind that such a thing must not come to pass. If you do that, then no destruction will come to the shores of your nation. We all stand guilty before God. You know, we have a television network called Angel TV. And the prophecies that I deliver, we make into little fillers and we telecast it 24-7. And our network is also available in, in the United States. And people are watching, hundreds and thousands of people on, our, on the DTH system, they're watching our channel. They heard it. Oh, oh. You know, this is our reaction. Oh, oh, period. That's all our reaction is. Oh, period. We walk away. We buy the CDs. We buy the DVDs. We take down notes. Period. What do you do about that? For such a time as this. You know, Mordecai told Esther, if you will not do anything about this, you and your household shall be destroyed. You know, if destruction comes, you also suffer, right? When the flooding came, you also suffer. When a typhoon comes, it brings through, wrecks apart through a nation, you suffer loss, right? The earthquake strikes, you suffer loss. So don't think you'll be spared. Don't think you'll be spared. You must bend your knees. This is what God is now expecting the remnant church to do. Come on, bend your knees. Lift up your hands and cry out. Lord, spare our nation. Spare our nation. Spare our nation. God expects you to cry. 
not just here and walk away. There in Michigan, God showed me George Washington. He said he's still praying for America. 